Welcome to session number five of Walking Together. And we have uh, a lot on our plate tonight. Um, we're gonna look at uh, sacraments in general. What is a sacrament? Uh, we're gonna look at the sacrament of baptism. And then connected to that is some other things that follow right along in the small catechism, uh, which is confession and absolution and the office of the keys. So um, we'll be here till dawn. No. We won't. <laughs> We'll try to get through it as quick as possible. Uh, why don't we pause now for a moment in prayer and ask the Lord to help us with us. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that everybody was able to join tonight. You're, you're sending rain, which is good. Uh, you're sending thunder and lightning, which is scary sometimes, but it, uh, it's a testimony to your power and your strength and reminds me that you watch over us even through the worst of times. So, I would pray, Lord, uh, that your will would be done, yet uh, we would all be able to have power so uh, throughout this evening so we can have this class and learn whether we're here in person or whether we're uh, through another one of your gifts, which is Zoom and the Internet. Holy Spirit, uh, engender our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear, to understand, and through this all not only gain information, but even more important, to draw closer to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And all this we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get the PowerPoint up and going. So baptism, confession, and the office of the keys. And uh, baptism and confession is a familiar thing to other uh, Christians out there. Office of the Keys is something that's uh, peculiar to Lutheranism, but it follows right along with the other two, and hopefully you'll understand that when we get to it. So, first of all, uh, baptism is a sacrament, and a sacrament is another thing that is uh, kind of particular to Lutheranism and Catholicism, and so we need to discuss what that is. What is a sacrament? A sacrament is a sacred act instituted by God to be used for his holy purpose. It's where God himself has joined his word of promise to a visible element, very important. So God is there and he's joined his word of promise, which is the gospel. And the other thing you have to have is a visible earthly element. Um, through this earthly element, through this sacrament, he is truly present, yet hidden, yet really there with all his almighty power. <clears throat> And those are all important because sometimes we tend to think of if something's hidden, well, it's not really there present in all its power. In other words, if I'm hiding in another room, I might be able to hear you, but I can't really speak to you. And if you act up, I can't really grab you by the neck and shake you, right? When we say God or Christ is hidden in these means, uh, in these earthly things, he is there with all his power and ready to work. And he hides himself or cloaks himself for our protection. Um, he is the holy God, and we are not. We are sinners. We cannot stand in the holy God's presence and live. So he, But he has this desire, and you see this throughout the Old Testament. He loves to spend, to be in the presence of his sinful people, yet hides himself through means to protect them from his glory, but is always there in power to work. Through the sacraments, he offers uh, and gives and seals us with the forgiveness of sins earned by Jesus Christ. That's the reason why he works through sacraments. These elements are what we call a means of grace, and they're vehicles by which uh, what Christ earned is delivered to us. And this is another important part about Lutheranism. God works through means. That's called uh, immediate working. Uh, uh, no, that's called it work, working immediately. Immediately means through means. We use the word immediately, which we think means right away. Immediately, as far as spiritual things goes, means God's working not through means. And can he do that? Have you ever heard of God working mysteriously, miraculously? Mm -hmm. When people are in trouble, <clears throat> car accidents, sending an angel, that's God working immediately but he loves to work through earthly means. And one of the greatest ways you can see that is why we're called to be the church. We're called to proclaim his gospel. And through that gospel, people come to faith 
And we are a means. We're a means for the Spirit to work. We're sometimes pretty broken means, but he loves to work through earthly, plain and broken things like me to teach this class. The word sacrament comes from a Latin word that means mystery. We don't understand how God is really present in these ways in baptism and in the Lord's Supper, but we believe by faith that he's there because in his word he tells us he is. And he tells us he does things in, his, in these sacraments to save us, and so we hold that by faith too. The Lutheran Church has two sacraments. Somebody want to read Acts 2.38 on the screen there? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's baptism. Be baptized, every one of you, and you receive what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. And how do you receive that? What is the gift that brings forgiveness of sins? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which is God. You receive God through baptism, his presence in your life. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 16, would somebody read that on the screen? The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is that not a participation in the body of Christ? Okay. So in this sacrament, what is it saying that we receive? The blood and the body of Jesus Christ. We receive, uh, yeah, we receive bread and we receive uh, the cup of blessing, which was wine. They were eating a Passover meal and they served wine. But with that, we're receiving the body and the blood of Christ. So he is present in these earthly means. And so we say, because of that, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament. He tells us to do this. Do this often in remembrance of me. We will get to the Lord's Supper next class. So let's look at baptism. And this is from the catechism. So these words in red, we're going to read all together like good children in the middle of class. Are we ready? Yes. <laughs> Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water included in God's command and combined with God's word, which is that word of God. And so we say together, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here is not only in these in this words what baptism is, but here in Matthew 28 we have Jesus commanding us to go do this. As Christians, we are God's baptized people. We are His adopted children together with all believers, and we live and die in the confidence that he has redeemed us, and we are his. The nature of baptism. What does the word baptize mean? Well, it comes from a Greek word which simply means to wash with water. Uh, Christian baptism is the washing done in the name of the triune God. But Christ didn't just pull this out of thin air, and the disciples didn't pull it out of thin air. Jewish men, so before Christ came, uh, throughout the time of Judaism, Jewish men washed themselves. And they washed their cups and pots, and even the couches that they sat on when they ate dinner. And all this was to signify spiritual purity. So they didn't have Mr. Clean or any of the soaps we have. You know, uh, you washed some of the dirt off, but it was more of a spiritual thing. It signified a cleansing. So it, within Jewish culture, you had this idea of washing, being cleansing spiritually, and John the Baptist took that and ran with it at the direction of uh, the Holy Spirit, and so did Jesus. How is the water used in baptism different than the water these Jewish men use to wash all their stuff with? The water itself, I mean, you could use water from the Jordan River, which, by the way, uh, when it's not the rainy season, uh, well, when it's the rainy season, the Jordan's pretty murky. And when it's not the rainy season, it's pretty sandy. It's not really good quality water. But that's where John was baptizing, because the water doesn't make any difference. No water is holier than another. You can use tap water. 
So in the Lutheran church, we don't have the holy water idea that the Catholic church does. Uh, the water of baptism is holy when we use it for the purpose that God tells us to use it for. And when we're done, the water left in the, in the bowl is no more holy than anything else. It is set apart. So we don't use it for any vile means, but it can be poured out on the ground because it served its purpose. Is the water blessed before you use no. it? No. So just, no. you just go for it, right? Yep. Immediately. Okay. The Holy Spirit, we believe he's present when we do, we're there to do what he, what he tells us to do. So um, when the Holy Spirit comes in the water, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but not this actual aspect, I don't think. But when does the Holy Spirit actually come? Whenever he wants. What we're promised is when I say in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, and I cut my hand and pour that water on their forehead three times, we're promised the Holy Spirit is there. But just like they didn't set aside water in the, Old, in the New Testament anytime they baptized when they were done with it, we don't believe that it remains holy water. And we're not told to use it for any purpose other than baptism. So we don't have the same kind of belief that the Catholic Church does about holy water. So, not, not that I'm trying to interrupt because I'm always a little curious about Please interrupt. Um, any any time you guys have questions, please interrupt. So go ahead, Candace. I'm sorry. So as far as the significance of like the Catholic holy water, you know, I'm I'm not quite. I, I'm still never quite understood what makes that. Um, besides it being called holy water, like how that ended up being blessed and used in the sacrament. I, I think, and I, uh, you know, I, I'm not 100% into Catholicism. I wasn't a Catholic before. Uh, but from what I understand, it really has to do more with their concept of the priest. Oh, okay. Uh, when, you, when you become a priest, your, your sins are especially forgiven. You don't sin anymore. So you're not a sinner saint. You're, you're blessed in a very particular way. And you have holy hands, which is what we in Lutheranism call them. So when you do things, you do things not necessarily by the power of God's word, where he says the spirit is present in baptism. The, the priest with his holy hands brings that about. He makes the water holy. So once he blesses that water, it remains holy water just because he's blessed it with his magic hands. Okay. And we have a big, big problem with that. Luther had a big problem with that. You're, and, and that goes all the way up to the Pope. You're investing power in a person that is totally unbiblical and you're raising them up to a level that's equal with Christ. And that's called idolatry. idolatry. So did I answer your question? Yeah, that did a little bit. Thank you. I think that's where it comes from. And they, they have a lot of beliefs. I mean, they'll use holy water when they do exorcisms and we just don't have a promise that that power exists. You're, you're trusting in the water instead of the Lord at that point, which is dangerous. So, uh, and once again, any of you interrupt me if you have a question, please. It's not a problem. The nature of baptism. Who should officiate the baptism? Anybody want to guess? The pastor. The pastor? Yes. The pastor of disaster. Yes. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Paul wrote, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And remember, we call the sacrament a mysterious event uh, where God works in supernatural ways. Paul's referring it to that. So uh, we being Paul and also the other we were those that Paul raised up to be leaders of the early church. And that includes pastors today. We're called to be ministers of the means of grace during communal worship. Means of grace being the proclamation of God's word, uh, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Holy Supper of community. However, in cases of emergency, especially if there's imminent, imminent death of the candidate, whether it's a baby or not, if they're not baptized, it is falls on you. You, the believer, can and should baptize. Um, I've seen it happen in a hospital, even if even if it wasn't the baby, they knew the baby was going to die but they were afraid or there was a chance. Uh, the baby is baptized in the hospital by the, by the father, by the mother, uh, by whatever believer is there. And if that happens, we can have a baptismal remembrance service later on in the church 
which is almost the same as if they were baptized here. The important thing is do it before they pass. That gives great assurance to mom and dad and also to the congregation and to that little child. Why do we baptize? Well, let's go back to Matthew 28, and that is on your uh, scripture cheat sheet there. Somebody want to read that off your scripture cheat sheet, the first verse listed there, please. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always, to the end of age. All right, let's break this down a little bit. What has been given to Christ according to these verses? Authority. What kind of authority? In heaven and on earth. All authority. Which means he rules over any human authority. So when we operate as the church, as his sent people, there's no one that can speak against us. It doesn't matter if government doesn't like it. It doesn't matter if the Democrat or Republican Party doesn't like it. It doesn't matter if atheists or unbelievers or agnostics or Buddhists or Muslims don't like it. We respond to a higher authority. We do so in love, but we understand that we operate with permission from him. And we don't have to worry about offending anybody uh, as far as authority goes. We don't want to offend out of love, but that's another thing. Therefore, since Christ has been given authority, what are we, what, what does he, he gives us authority to do what? Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. And what is that, what is, what is along with that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So part of making disciples of all nations is baptizing. Mm -hmm. And it operates kind of this way. We baptize babies first with the promise that we will teach them the faith as they grow up. If it's an adult, we teach first and then baptize. But they go hand in hand. And you see right there that the baptism is done in the name of the triune God, and Jesus lays that name out. What else do we teach them? Observe all that I've commanded you. All that he has commanded us. So everything that he's taught the disciples in the Gospels, that's what we teach them. Here's what Jesus taught. And then we have Paul's epistles, which are kind of um, additional commentary on what Jesus taught, uh, along with the other epistles in the New Testament. And of course, the Old Testament ties right in, so we teach that as well, because that teaches us the promise of Jesus. And also, you find some of the greatest descriptions of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross in the Psalms and in Isaiah. So, we teach all of Scripture. What promise does Christ give, and why is this important? He will be with us always to the end of the age. As we go do this at the, as the church, we are not alone. He is with us. His power is with us. He's the one that told us to go do this, and he's the one that does it through us, and he's the one that opens the doors. And that's why it's important. We're not on our own. We're not operating as free agents without any power. We're empowered by the same power that created the whole universe and still rules over it now. And that power goes with us. What are the blessings of baptism? What benefits does baptism give? This is from the catechism, so let's read together. It works for forgiveness of sins, rescues from death into evil, and which are these words and promises of God? Together we read, Christ, Christ our Lord, 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 in the last chapter of Mark, whoever, whoever believes and baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. As Christians, we confess, I am baptized. Notice on the screen there the little uh, exclamation point. God promises that because I've been washed with water, 
He has forgiven and saved me, and I can trust his promises. And there are times in life when we might sin and the devil's working hard in our own guilty conscience, and we're wondering, man, could Jesus really forgive this? The person that I offended is struggling to forgive. I can look back and remember my baptism and know the promise I have through that. Yes, he has forgiven me and he has saved me and his promise was made true in that water of baptism. I can hang on to that. Other religions have, you ever heard of an altar call? Yes. Okay. Altar calls are kind of used like that by people. Um, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I responded to the altar call. I went up there and I, did, I said the sinner's prayer, and I know I'm saved. But well, you know what they found out from revivals? The next day, people came back again and went up for the same altar call because the effect, the emotion of that time when they were up there is worn off. And they thought they were saved because oh, I felt this. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. It was just so joyful, and I was so excited that the next morning comes, and you're tired, and the devil's talking to you, and your own sinful conscience is like, wow, did that really happen? So you have to go back and do it again. Baptism is a once and done. And we believe it because God's promises and scriptures say when you're baptized, you're saved. You have faith. You believe you're saved. It's a sure promise than any altar call, than any emotional experience. It is true even when you don't feel like you're saved. So let's look at some of these blessings of baptism. We've got a number of verses to read there. Somebody want to read Acts 2.38 on your sheet. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So here in baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit into our hearts, and he remains with us. So each one of you that are baptized, you have the God of the universe with you 24-7. You are the temple of God, and he lives in you, and he protects you. And he comes, and he works forgiveness of sins. And by the way, a Christian who's been baptized and believes never has to worry about demon possession because you have one stronger and more powerful in you. The devil cannot touch you. Let's read now Colossians 1, 13 through 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So in baptism, we are delivered from the devil's kingdom of darkness. It's a kingdom we were born into. We were born sinners. If Jesus had not saved us, we would remain there and suffer with the devil eternally in hell. He transferred us into Jesus' kingdom. In baptism, his hand through the Holy Spirit reaches into you, pulls you out of the devil's kingdom, and places you in his kingdom and keeps you there. So we, in baptism, are saved from the devil. Romans 6, 3 to 5. Somebody want to read that? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Resurrection. No problem. So in baptism, our sinful self dies with Christ and is buried with him. That's that part of us that longs to sin. Uh, whatever your temptation is, whether it's thought, word, or action, there's a part of us that just yearns to do that. Sometimes it's because we become overcome with emotion. Other times, well, things that we used to do and still want to do. That part dies with Christ and is buried with him, and we rise with him to walk in newness of life. We're given a new heart and a new mind, one that wants to obey Christ. 
one that's been renewed and understands, begins to understand the will of Christ and the will of God. And we have the Holy Spirit to help us truly understand what his word is saying and apply it to our lives, what it means to us. And because we're united with Christ, we died with him and we rise with him and, we, and we, we've given this new life. We will rise with him on the last day, just as he did with Easter. Baptism unites us in a very personal, intimate way with Jesus' death and resurrection. It becomes ours. And as he died, we die. And as he rose again, we certainly will rise again. So in baptism, we are rescued from eternal death. And then finally, Titus 3, 5 to 7. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but by according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The washing, regeneration, and renewal. The water of baptism is symbolic of the Spirit washing the sin away from us and renewing us in faith and in a life more like Christ's. And justified means that we are, we are just with God. He no longer has anything he holds against us in the way of sin. And that earns us something. It's actually something that Christ earned for us. It's eternal life. And we receive it. We become heirs. Um, as, 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 a, as a child of your parents, when they pass, you receive an inheritance, right? Mm -hmm. In baptism, you become a child of the Heavenly Father, and you become an heir of all he has to give you, and the greatest gift he has to give is eternal life. So we become heirs of eternal life through baptism because we are made his precious children. Why do I need baptism if Christ has already won full forgiveness and salvation for me? Let's say I was never baptized as a child. Candace came along, and I'm at the doctor's office there, and every time I see her, she's nice and she's smiling. Candace, why are you like that? She says, because Jesus has changed my life, and I love people like Jesus does, and he's given me a new outlook, and she tells me the gospel. And you know what? I believe. I have faith. I'm saved. If that's the case, why do I need baptism? I'm already saved, right? This is an argument a lot of people have. Jesus' death and resurrection means he has paid the, the price. He has paid for every person's sins. All men's sins were paid. Even Charles Manson, all sin, Jesus took upon himself. So there's no human being that has lived or ever will live that should go to hell. It's all been paid for. That's what Jesus' suffering and death was. Baptism is the mean by which what Christ won for all men on the cross is given to you, Tim, and you, Barb, and you, Candace, and you, Paul, and you, Wendy, and you, Shawnee. In baptism, you were given this. Here, this gift Christ won for all men is now yours, and you can write your name on it, mine. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Washed clean of your sins. Sanctified means you were set apart to be holy people for his purposes. And you're justified. God holds nothing against you. He declares you innocent in his eternal court of all sin. In baptism, you are adopted as a child of God into his family. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Through baptism we have this wonderful picture. We are being incorporated into his family, his body, the church. One of my favorite things after baptizing a child is to present them before the congregation and have them welcome this new member of the body of Christ. And Paul in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians has a great word picture. I think we read it a couple times ago about how the church is like a body. Somebody's a finger, somebody's an eye, somebody's a toenail. All those parts are important. 
And when we baptize a child or an adult, we've just welcomed a new important part of this body that up until that time was missing. And now God's brought them and has something for them to do as part of his mission. Because we become members of the family, we inherit all the blessings of a family member, which is all God has to give, which is forgiveness of sin, salvation, and eternal life. Is it possible for an unbaptized person to be saved? What do you think? Yes. Good answer. Yes. Only unbelief condemns somebody to internal hell. If you refuse the gospel message your entire life, I don't need Jesus. I'm good enough. I don't believe Jesus existed. How could somebody die and rise again? Whatever your, your thing is, if you believe that to the end of your life and you die in that faith, you're condemned. Peter, 1 Peter 1, chapter, or, uh, verse 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. So the word of God, the gospel, is what makes you born again. However, this is the other side of that. Why do you need to be baptized if you've already heard the gospel and believe? Christ commanded baptism. Matthew 28, right? Go and baptize all nations. It provides as a means of grace. It connects a material object to bolster faith. It's God's gift to us because he knows we struggle. You have this gospel message, which is just words. How do I know these words are any more important than any other words? Well, they're Christ's words. But we still struggle with that because Christ is not proclaiming them. I am who's a sinful human being, even though I'm a pastor. So we're given this wonderful gift of water with the word and God's promise. When this happens, Tim Hill, you've received the Holy Spirit. Tim Hill, come on down for the Holy Spirit is right. <laughs> a wonderful gift. And if you look at it that way, why would you not want it? God's offering it. Can a baptized believer fall away from faith? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is important because there are denominations out there that say once saved, always saved. And if you believe that, after all, this is sealing. You're sealed in the Holy Spirit. No one outside you can take your faith away but you can give it up. And let's look at these two verses to see that. Somebody read 1 Corinthians uh, 10, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest least the he fell. Now, this is Paul speaking to the church. He's speaking to believers, warning them, if you're not careful, you can fall. And it's not falling on the floor because you're drunk. It's falling away from faith. Read now uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Fall from the faith. What does that tell you? That tells you that they used to believe, right? Right. They were part of the faith and they listened to somebody who was preaching another gospel other than what Jesus preached or what Paul preached or what we preached out of scripture. And they believed that and in doing so left their faith behind. And that can happen. And there's a lot of really good sounding words out there. Uh, there's a guy who uh, down in wherever it was, Texas or whatever they used to fill, I guess he still does, uh, fills a whole auditorium full of people. And he preaches some awesome words, some awesome words about how Jesus wants you to have a good life now. And if you just obey his commands, you'll have health and wealth. And oh yeah, give a lot of money because it'll all come back in return. Those are all good words, but it has nothing to do with you being a sinner and Jesus being a savior. Jesus is somebody that came to save you for this life now. And if that's all you have, this world is ending. It's a dying world. If he's saving you just for this world. God help you. Give up, uh, give up eternal life for this world? I don't think so. So, you can. A baptized believer can fall away from faith. Part of what we, when we baptize children, when I counsel the parents, uh, or even the person if it's an adult, I say, you have to keep working. Those children need to, need to be read scripture. They need to have Bible study done at home. 
bring them here for Bible study, bring them to church. They need to have constant contact with the Lord. Okay. I'm actually trying to get, I, I minimized you guys. I'm trying to get you guys all back on the screen. There we go. Okay. Why do we baptize infants? And this is important because there's a lot of our sister, uh, other denominations that don't. Uh, some of them have christening that they do with babies, and they hold off until they reach an age of accountability when the child can actually verbally state their faith. They don't believe that baptizing infants is proper because they don't believe that infants can actually believe. But let's look at these verses. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commands us to baptize, quote unquote, all nations, or a better translation would be all ethnic groups. Does that sound like it includes babies? It doesn't at first, but I could, I could see it doing that. Jesus doesn't say all adults. All right. Nations. Pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? But, you know, that's not all we look at. Let's look at this. The apostles baptized entire families. Families in the New Testament meant all people, adults and children. Let's look at some of these verses. Somebody read Acts 2, 38 and 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. For this promise is for you and your children. Now, I've heard some arguments with children. I have, I have adult children. Uh, I have one that's 24, one that's 26 or 27, and one that's 30. But this word in Greek that's used for children means children that live in your household. They are dependent children. They depend on you to raise them and train them and feed them. This word children means youngsters, little ones. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 16. Somebody read that. <clears throat> I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Once again, we have Paul saying he baptized a household. Household usually means children. Acts 16, 13 to 15. Let's read that. Hold on question first. Sure. You said uh, that it's for your younger children, but it says for the promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Means that you're away from home? No. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you know, that, that, is, that is true. This is on Pentecost and Peter is preaching to uh, 500 or so or probably more Jews that were gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate this Jewish festival called Pentecost. So the promise is for you and your children that are here in Jerusalem to celebrate this, but also for those who aren't here. And really, through the Holy Spirit, Peter's talked about not just Jews, Gentiles, everyone in the whole world. But yeah, in a sense, it does mean your family that's not even here, it's for them too. Good. Uh, Acts 16, 13 to 15. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyaria, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Uh... Read 15 too. Okay. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So she was baptized and her household as well. She urged them to come and stay. If it was just her and a husband, I doubt she would use the word household. Once again, household is kind of understood in the Greek to mean 
children. Over and over again, we see the apostles baptizing entire families. Do you think if the Lord didn't want us to baptize children, somewhere in these verses, the Spirit would have moved them to say that? Well, yeah, I baptized Stephanus and his wife. Of course, we don't baptize babies. But we don't see that stipulation in here. We do have Peter saying it's for you and your children. Babies are born sinful and need the gifts that baptism delivers. This is another thing that's very commonly stood against in other uh, denominations and outside of the church. You look, oh, baby, so innocent and sweet. Well, is it? Uh, Psalm 51.5, let's read that. Behold, I was brought forth in this iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Conceived in sin, brought forth in sin, was born with sin. David hadn't done anything yet when he was a baby. He hadn't killed Bathsheba, or Bathsheba's husband and had a, an adulterous affair with anybody. He was born that way. Uh, John 3, 5 through 6. Somebody want to read that? Jesus answered, oh, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Children are born of the flesh, and here flesh is associated with sin. Because through Adam, sin has invaded all flesh, all descendants of Adam and Eve, which is what we are. You have to be born again by the Spirit. And notice Jesus says, uh, well, it, also in here, it's not in this verse, oh, born of water. There you have it. How is one born again? Through water and the promise of God. Uh, another example of why children, we can say children are not born without sin or are not in need of salvation is, at what point do you teach your children to disobey? You don't. They just naturally do it, don't they? Yes. You have to teach them to obey. Because they are born as sinners. And they have the same sinful, selfish heart that we do. The Holy Spirit does have power to work faith in babies. Before we look at these verses, think about who the Holy Spirit is. He's a member of the triune God. He was there at creation. He has the power that created the whole entire universe. Does he not have the power within himself to work faith wherever and whenever he wants? Yes. Yes. In fact, he can work faith without any means. But he chooses to use means. And let's see how he chooses means to save even babies. Let's look at Psalm 22, verses 9 to 10. Somebody want to read that? Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's room, womb you have been my God. I can't remember if you believe it or not. Whoever the psalmist is, how long has God been his God? Pretty much as long as time has existed. From the womb. Even though we're born in sin, the Holy Spirit can work faith before the child is even born or at birth. You took me from the womb. You made me trust in you. Even when I was a little baby that couldn't speak and was suckling at my mom's breast, I had faith. Matthew 21, 16. Somebody want to read that? And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. This reading comes from uh, the uh, Palm Sunday. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem and the people are proclaiming him as the Messiah. They think he's going to be the Messiah that will defeat Rome, but they're praising him as a God sent servant. And, uh, Everybody is praising him as such, and the Pharisees don't like this. They say to Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? And the Pharisees are thinking, we keep saying this. Rome's going to come down. It's going to rip us apart. And Jesus responds, have you never read from Scripture, 
out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise. Nobody can truly praise God without faith. How can you believe that Jesus is the Christ or is the servant of God or is worthy with praise without faith? The dude was from Nazareth. He didn't look it. The only way was through faith to believe. And that was Jesus' point. These infants are even praising him because why? They have faith. Now let's look at Luke 1, verses 39 to 44. Somebody want to read that? Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Okay, bonus time. Does anybody know who the babe in Elizabeth's womb is? John? John the Baptist. And so here we have a very unique meeting. The mother of our Lord, Mary, who's carrying Jesus in her womb, meets Elizabeth, who's carrying John the Baptist. And what is John the Baptist in the womb? What is his reaction to being in the presence of the Savior? He jumps. Leaps for joy. This is not a kick because he's uncomfortable because it's too constricting. He knows. The Spirit has let him know that he's in the presence of his Savior. And what knowledge that is, I mean, obviously he can't say that in the womb. But whatever knowledge is needed to recognize that Jesus is this to him, John the Baptist, as an unborn infant, has it. Jesus commanded that infants be brought to him and not hindered. And this verse is part of our liturgy in baptism. So let's read this, Mark 10, 13 to 16. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, or no, I'm saying that wrong, indignant, and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Great word. Now here we don't have water involved. We don't have the word baptism. What we do have is we have Jesus. And we have these little children. And some of them moms have to carry. And they want to come to Jesus. But the disciples don't want them to. Jesus is teaching adults. And, you know, kids, it's not like they weren't loved. But if you weren't old enough to actually confess faith and read the Torah in the synagogue, you were really just set aside for now until you gained that knowledge. And they were unimportant. You kept the kids out of the way so the adults could do what they needed to do. Jesus was like, no. He's indignant. And you can tell that because Jesus says the same thing twice, positively and negatively. Let the little children come to me. Let them. This is, a, this is what we call an imperative. It's a command. Let them come. Positive. Do not hinder them. Negative. Jesus is serious. Same thing, positive and negative. Get out of the way, Peter. Get out of the way, John. Let them come. You know why? Because to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. If you want to receive the kingdom, you've got to receive it like these children. And the children had what we call a childlike faith. They didn't need to say, well, what are you going to do, Jesus? You're going to suffer? And how is that going to be for me? And, and why is your suffering for me? And how is that connected with the Old Testament sacrifices? They didn't ask that. They just believed that he is the one that saved them from sin in whatever way and means that that meant in their heart. And they couldn't pronounce it. And they couldn't make any statement of faith. Yet they believed. And belief in the heart is different than cognitive thinking in the head. It's a separate thing. Cognitive thinking in the head comes when it comes to the heart first. First the heart, and then the head. And then, after Jesus tells them, you got to have childlike faith if you want to come to the... What does he do? 
he takes them in his arms and blesses them, laying his hands on them. Here we have God the Son and the child. Wouldn't you have loved to be one of those child children? Sitting on his lap, he is physically connecting with them and blessing with them. In baptism, through the water, the Holy Spirit's hand comes in connection with you, and he lays his hand on you. Jesus blessed them. Now, we don't have what that blessing is, but what kind of a blessing do you think Jesus would give somebody? Well, he could have told them, okay, little Johnny, little Timmy, I hope when you run back, you don't skin your knee, and I hope you listen to your mom and you get all your favorite foods. Is that how Jesus is going to bless somebody? No. no. Jesus came to give the blessing of eternal life. He gave them the blessing of eternal life. That's baptism. Now, we don't have Jesus here in our sanctuary for kids to come and sit on his lap. It'd be great if we did. But Jesus, when he appears next time, we're promised he's going to be in all his glory. Kids wouldn't sit on his lap. Kids and adults would fall over dead being in the presence of Jesus in all his glory. Instead, we have him working through means. Remember means? which is the water and the word of baptism. That's why we baptize children, because over and over again, they have the need, the Spirit has proved he's powerful enough to work, and Jesus commands. How can water do such great things? This is from the Catechism, so we read together. Certainly not just not water, this water, but the word, but the word. And God with God the water does do these things which trust us God in the water. So without God, the water is no baptism. But with the word, the word God is the baptism. That is that is giving water in grace. Washing the washing of you, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the as Christians, we can say, I am baptized, I am washed, I am God's own child and heir of heaven. My confidence is in these great gifts based entirely on God's word and promises. We see only water. And we ask, how can water work such great things as forgiveness of sins, a rescue from death and the devil, and give eternal salvation? Christ's institution of baptism places these blessings in the baptismal water, and we receive them by faith. Christ's institution of baptism saying, this is what happens in baptism, is why we hold fast to it. So somebody read first, uh, or read Galatians 3, 26 to 27. For in Jesus Christ, you are all sons of God, through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Jesus have put on Christ. Baptized into, put on. And it used to be in, in the older days when you baptized a child, uh, after the baptism happened, you would put a white gown on. Sometimes they would wear it before, but the white gown represented the new life you have in Christ, white representing sinless. You were now declared sinless. You've been washed clean of your sins. You have put on the righteousness or the sinlessness of Christ. Baptized into Christ, you put it on. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Christ's sinlessness that was given to you in baptism. Uh, Colossians 2, 11 to 15. Let's read that. In him also you were circumcised and with circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and in uncircumcision of your flesh 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So here we need to have an understanding of, of, of circumcision. Circumcision was kind of like uh, the sacrament of the Old Testament, not exactly. It wasn't promised forgiveness like we do, but it was a sign. And if it was a sign by cutting off the foreskin of a male, it was supposed to symbolize a, a, a more internal spiritual cutting off of sin in the heart. Sin was cut off in the heart, allowing you to believe and have obedience towards Yahweh or towards God. Uh, baptism is even greater circumcision in that it cuts off that sin right directly from our heart by the Holy Spirit. He cuts that sin off and gets rid of it. It's washed away. And now we are able to obey with the power of the Spirit that we have. And uh, great promises in here. Uh, we are made alive together with Christ. Our debt has been canceled. It stood against us. On the last day, instead of having all of the stuff and the crap that you and I have done in our lives regurgitated and laid out before us, it's canceled. The debt has been paid. It's gone. It's nailed to the cross, and it's gone. Question. Is a Christian's faith in baptism or in Jesus? In Jesus, it should be. It's really a false alternative. Candace is right. Our faith is in Jesus. We have faith in baptism because Jesus puts his word of promise in the water of baptism. Therefore, our faith is in baptism where Christ places his promise. But Christ comes first. If we don't believe in Christ, we're not going to believe baptism does not But because Christ tells us all these things over and over again, we do have faith that our baptism works and does what it says because Jesus says it does. Matthew 3, 13 to 15. Then Jesus came, this is the story of Jesus' baptism. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. If baptism was necessary for the righteousness of the perfect Son of God, Righteousness meaning making you in right standing with God. You're no longer his enemy because of sin. Now you are in agreement totally with him. He holds nothing against you. You are in right standing. If it was necessary for Jesus, who was already in right standing, he was the sinless son of God who had no sin, yet Jesus says it's necessary. How much more necessary is it for you and I, who have a ton of stuff that otherwise would stand in the way of us being right with God? We continue on with Jesus' baptism. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, when I baptized you or baptized a child in church here, you don't see it. But you want to know what the spiritual reality is? The Holy Spirit is descending upon that child like a dove at that moment. And through that baptism, we have this promise. The Father is declaring that you, Tim Hill, you, Barb, you, Shawnee, you, Paul, you, Wendy, you, Candace, are my beloved son, my beloved daughter, washed clean, and in you, because of Christ, I am well pleased. What a blessing is that. And that's something to think about every time you see a child baptized. That is what's happening. Even though we don't see it, that's the spiritual reality. What baptism indicates? What does such baptizing with water indicate? We read from the catechism together. It indicates old Adam and
this is something that uh, what we call the ongoing power of baptism. We only are baptized once, but that's because it has a power that continues to work in our lives. Where is this written? Together we read Saint Paul. We therefore as Christians, we can confess, I am baptized, and now I have a daily battle, confessing my sins and drowning them, and also living the new life according to God's goodness and love. First of all, what is this old Adam? Ephesians 4.22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former mammar of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. It's the part in us that we inherited from Adam. It's the propensity to sin. It's the sinful desire, the sinful heart that is always active within us. Our sinful nature, corrupted from birth by original sin. What is the new man? 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's the new nature that Christ instills in us that wants to obey him, that loves him, that holds fast to the fact that he has forgiven us and made us new and cleansed people, and we want to live that kind of life. It is our new nature where the image of the God that was lost in the fall is being restored by the Holy Spirit working through the means of grace. Notice that's present tense, is being restored. That image of God we lost in the fall won't be completely restored until Christ returns on the last day. We are constantly a work in progress. And we won't get there until the resurrection. But guess who's working on us? The Holy Spirit, and he won't give up. Every day, he works on us. So what we have is the ongoing battle. The daily life of a Christian is putting off the old Adam through confession and repentance and putting on the new man through our faith in Christ. It's the ongoing battle in the life of a Christian, the new man versus the old Adam. This is what Paul's describing in Romans chapter 7. And Tim, I think you asked about it last time. This I have a GW there. This uh, Romans chapter 7 I've drawn from a, uh, a translation called God's Word. I think it lays it out a lot clearer in our language. So... Paul writes, I know that God's standards are spiritual, but I have a corrupt nature, sold as a slave to sin. That's the old Adam. I don't realize what I'm doing. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do what I hate. He says, I know what God's obedience means. I know it means I should love other people, but you know what? I constantly find myself, they're pissing me off, and I hate them. Paul says, I don't do what I want to do, but I still agree God's standards are good. I agree I should love my neighbor. I should help him. I should talk kindly to him. I should overlook all the ways that he pisses me off. So Paul says, I'm no longer the one who is doing these things I hate, but the sin that lives in me, that sinful corrupt nature is moving me to do these things that the new man in me really doesn't want to do. So Paul says, I know nothing good lives in me. That is nothing good lives in my corrupt nature. It is totally corrupt. Although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I don't want to do. Keep in mind, this is Paul, the believer. Paul, who had on the road to Damascus, was called and given faith. Paul, who's been working and preaching the gospel among the Gentiles. Guess what? Super Apostle Paul struggles the same way you and I do in our faith life. He goes on to say, Now, when I do what I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one doing it. It's the sin living within me that's doing it. So I've discovered this truth. Evil is present within me, even when I want to do what God's standards say is good. I take pleasure in God's standards in my inner being. So he has this part of him, the new man, that loves what God says should be done and wants to do it, yet evil is still present. The new man and the old Adam existing side and side by us. And what do they do? They fight. And that's our lives as Christians. Paul says, however, I see a different standard at work through my body. It is at war with the standards of my mind and sets and tries to take me captive to sin standards which still exist throughout my body. In the Greek, in the, this sentence is filled with war terminology and army terminology. 
which is why this translates war and takes me captive, just like an enemy soldier would be taken captive. It's a war that rages within us, a spiritual war. What a miserable person I am, and that's our confession on Sunday morning, isn't it? I am a poor, miserable sinner. Who will rescue me from my dying body? And before I put that verse up there, give me the children's message answer. Who will rescue me? Jesus. Jesus! I thank God that our Lord Jesus Christ rescues me, or a better translation is, saves me. We all have this battle going on, but in the end, it's Christ who is the victor and who saves us. Paul is describing the spiritual warfare that rages within Christians daily. Our old sinful Adam is put to death in baptism, but it's a slow death. We continue to desire the old sinful ways, and kind of a good way to look at this is he's dying, and we pick him back up and go, hey, what should we do now, huh? Because we like those old sinful ways. We resurrect him. There's another image that talks about being bound in chains by the devil and our sin. And Christ comes and rips those chains off of us. And we're going along okay and we're looking for reasons that don't make a lot of sense spiritually. We pick up those chains and wrap them back around us again. They're bound by the sin that we continue to do. Alongside the sinful Adam is the new man, the new creation, the redeemed heart that desires to plead Jesus. The Holy Spirit works to build up the desires of the redeemed heart in us. That's our life. Even as we want to obey the sinful man, the Holy Spirit resurrects and empowers that new man so that we want to obey and do obey him. And this is what's called confession and absolution. Confession and absolution is the ongoing pouring out and work of our baptism within us daily as Christians. The Holy Spirit works in us through God's word of law to move us to see the times we've pleased the sinful Adam, to show us when we've sinned, and then makes us feel sorrow over these times and to confess them before our Lord and our fellow man, and then to hear and hold fast to the words of absolution, the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. Yes, you've sinned, but you are forgiven because I have taken care of that. That offense no longer stands before me or my father. So, what is confession? This is from the uh, Catechism, so let's read together. Confession has two parts. First, second, confess our sins. And second, that we receive our sins. What sins should we confess? Once again, from the catechism we read together. Before God, God, God should we be guilty of our sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do realize that so know that we sin far more than what we realize. If the Holy Spirit was to truly in your eye reveal all the sins I do in a day, I would be crushed. But he doesn't. Which is why in our confession in church, it's kind of a general confession. For those things we have done and left undone, those that we know of and those we don't know of, we confess not just acts, but that we are in ourselves poor sinful beings who have sinned in ways that we don't even sometimes realize. Which sins are these? Uh, from the Catechism, Luther writes, Consider your according to the commandments. Are you a father? Son, daughter, husband, wife, and worker. Have you you notice when we, when we do the confession and absolution in church, normally I allow a time for self-meditation. What are you meditating on? Look at the Ten Commandments and look at how you failed them in your vocation. Father, mother, daughter, husband, wife, worker, neighbor, citizen. 
and then disobedience and faithfulness lazy. And we can all find something to confess to ourselves in those things. To whom should we make confession? Before God, we're to confess all our sins, known and unknown. We are four sinful human beings. Unknown that we are sinners by nature, sinful and unclean, sinning in thought, word, and deed. Known, those sins that the Spirit brings to mind, especially the ones that trouble us. And sometimes you can be troubled so greatly it can almost stand in the way of your faith. That's why we need someone to come before us and say, you're forgiven. Who do we, uh, before our neighbor, we should confess those things we have done to offend them or hurt them. And this should include asking forgiveness. So if I was pissed off, as I said, against my neighbor, I need to go tell him. I need to go say, you know what, what I said to you, even though you were throwing crap on my lawn, what I said to you was wrong. I'm sorry. You're good up till there, but you need to go a step further. Please forgive me. We ask forgiveness from the Father, and we should also ask forgiveness from those human beings whom we offend. Uh, when Susan and I used to teach uh, children's class, uh, parenting classes, we impress that upon parents. Teach that to your children. Not just to say, I'm sorry. You can be sorry for anything. I'm sorry it's raining outside. I'm not taking any responsibility for it. I, I surely am sorry. But if I poured a bucket of water on you, Tim, I'm sorry. That was wrong. Please forgive me. I've taken ownership of it. And I've reached out the hand to you. Now it's in your court. You can forgive me or not, but knowing that I've already asked forgiveness of my father, if you forgive me, then it's, I don't mean this in a crass way, but it's on you. I know the father forgives me. I'll continue to treat you with love, but. Where do we make confession? We can do it in corporate worship. Public confession, we do that every divine service. We realize we're not alone in our sinfulness and we stand together with our brothers and sisters seeking mercy. I don't know if you've ever felt this, but next time we do public confession, think about that. It's not just me, it's us. And the devil has used this on me greatly. I see people come in, it's even before I was a pastor, everybody's got a smile on their face, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Everything's going great. And you wanna be honest? I'm not doing great. I'm struggling. I've got doubts. I've got things that I've said to my spouse and my children, to my coworkers. I'm burdened. And in that corporate confession, I realize we're all burdened. We've all got stuff that we're confessing. And it's a way to emphasize with one another, you're not alone. Devil wants you to think, well, you're messed up. Everybody else here is great. You know what? If you spent time and do this sometime, especially with people that you meet for the first time. How you doing, Tim? Candace, how you doing? Doing great, how about you? Now, Candace, how are you really doing? Well. <laughs> a good friend of mine, a good guy who's an evangelist said, brace yourself. When you ask people how they're really doing so they know we're not just doing the hi, hello, how are you thing. Brace yourself because everybody's got a load of crap in their life that they're dealing with. And if it's not with them or their spouse or their kids, it's with family members or neighbors or somebody close. We hear the absolution and worship, Christ's word of promise and forgiveness, spoken in his place and at his command by his called and ordained servant, the pastor. In the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you should picture Jesus standing there, not me, and he's using my mouth, and I'm telling you what he has said in scripture, and it's the gospel truth. It is the absolute truth. You are forgiven. So, we can make confession in corporate worship. You can also do private confession. A lot of people don't know this. They think this went out with the bathwater uh, with Catholicism. We do private confession. It's something that you can do with me. You can set up a time. If something is really bothering you, come in, and there's a right out of the LS for private confession that we can actually do. But you don't have to just stop there. Whatever's on your heart, whatever you're struggling with, you can tell me. One-on-one, -on -one. And, the, and the thing about with me is there's pastoral confidentiality. I cannot and will not tell anybody else. Probably if somebody was to come in, what I've done in the past would say, have you killed anybody? Because if you have, well, I'm not gonna get on the phone to the police, but I'm gonna really be on your case. You need to confess. You need to go call them. 
The other thing I would ask is, have you molested a child? Because that's something I will not keep to myself. Other than that, whatever you've done, it's between you and I and the Lord. And I'm not going to tell a soul, and nobody can drag me into court and make me as pastoral confidentiality. You don't have that with anybody else in the world, only with your pastor. You have the personal assurance and absolution. And this was a great experience for me in seminary. Uh, it's a struggle there. And, and the spiritual uh, warfare there is great. The devil wants you to quit and leave. And to have a human being and a professor that I looked up to look me in the eye and say, Mark, you're forgiven. You know that? Jesus died for you. And he tells you to have a human being look me in the eye and put his hand on my shoulder or put his arms around me and hug me and tell me that. It is an awesome gift. Like I said, we, there's an official right in the hymnal that we can use to do that. You can also make private confession to another believer. If you're not comfortable coming to me, or I'm not around, or it's not uh, conducive to your schedule, make sure it's somebody you're, you're comfortable with, somebody you know. Make sure that they're a firm believer in Christ, because you're not going to be uh, benefited by anybody telling you you're forgiven if they don't believe that themselves. And with them, you have no assurance of confidentiality, as you do with a pastor. If you ever decide to do that, there is a short form of confession in your small catechism. You can use that. Now, move on to the next thing, which is also related to confession and absolution, the office of the keys. When I was at seminary, I worked, uh, one of my jobs was to work in the Welcome Center. It's one of the first buildings you came to when you entered the seminary. And uh, there was this office downstairs in the basement. It was next to the break room where I would keep my lunch. And it had on the outer door the office of the keys. And it had this picture you're looking at on the PowerPoint. It had that on the door. And uh, we never knew what was in there because the keys I had to that building didn't open that door. And they happened to do, they were, they were testing the alarm system, the fire alarm system, the sprinkler system, and whatnot. And... Uh, so they purposely made the alarms go off and then where they were at, they couldn't reset them. And they went to all the boxes and stuff in that building and other buildings and they couldn't reset it. The reset was in that room that nobody had a key to. <laughs> the office of the keys, if nobody had a key to that room, they had to break the door down to reset it to get the stupid alarm off. <laughs> That's not the office of the key, by the way. It was a, I was going to say, what was in the office? Of the it was the master reset for all the alarm systems. Yeah. <laughs> so what is, when we talk about the office of the keys, spiritually, what is it? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, or which those sinners that confess their sinners and want to change their life and believe that they have forgiveness from them from the Holy Spirit, from Christ. Uh, to forgive repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not believe. Those that refuse to believe that Jesus died on the cross and they're forgiven through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20 of his gospel. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive his sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Notice this proclamation and this authority Jesus gives the disciples goes along with the breathing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is deeply involved in the office of the keys and our power to do that. The, the power and authority comes from the Holy Spirit. What do you believe according to these words? And together we read from the Catechism. I believe that when the call is very important part. The forgiveness pronounced in worship is just as valid even if Christ had boomed down his voice from above and said it himself. It's the special authority Christ has given his church. God alone can forgive sin. God is the judge. Christ delegates this authority to his church to announce to them 
his forgiveness of sins to all who repent in faith and to proclaim the words of law to the unrepentant sinners that because they do not believe, they are condemned to everlasting hell. We, as the church, can pronounce these two things on the authority of God's word. You can pronounce these things on the authority of God's word. Why is it called the office of the keys? Matthew 16, 19, and notice this says pastor's translation. This is mine from the Greek, but I checked it with one of my uh, sainted professors who wrote the Concordia commentary on Matthew. So I'm fairly good with this, but it just, this, this is what it's saying in Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you may bind on earth, binding mean whatever you declare prohibited will already have been bound or declared prohibited in heaven. What you declare, Tim, to somebody tomorrow, you don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned to hell. You're saying that because that's already been declared in heaven because they do not believe. That's the word from God. Unbelief means bound in hell. Bound in sin and is headed to hell. And whatever you may loose or release or unbind on earth will already have been loosed, unreleased, or unbound in heaven. According to whether somebody believes in the gospel or not, we get to pronounce right now in real time what's already been said in heaven. Faith in Christ unbinds and releases from, from sin, death, and the devil and hell. Unbelief remains bound and you're headed to hell. That makes sense? So it's not something, well, I like Tim, so I'll tell him he's forgiven. It's not that. What I'm, for, what I'm declaring is the reality in heaven based on God's word. Why is it called the office of the keys? These are the keys that unlock eternal life for those who believe and lock the gate to eternal life for those who refuse to believe. This is a special pointed pronouncement of the gospel, I by the authority of Christ. When the pastor does it in worship, we call it the absolution. Special applications. The office of the keys also is used to describe what we call church discipline. There's something called the minor ban, which is an excluding an unrepentant sinner from communion. This would be if somebody came to me, let's say they're married, and they're constantly coming to worship with their next door neighbor who they're not married to, and they're holding hands and they're kissing, and they're telling people, yeah, I've kind of left my wife and I'm living with this person. Uh, I'll talk with them, and if they continue to do this and refuse to repent, I would bar them from the table. Or if they came up for communion, I wouldn't serve them the minor ban. This is exercised by the pastor. And, I, and I, the pastor would do it as the authority that comes with the office of the key. There's excommunication, which is an official pronouncement by the congregation that the unrepentant sinners continuing to live in sin are no longer members, are excluded from every privilege of fellowship of the church, including the Lord's Supper but are still allowed to attend and hear God's word. This is something that would be done through the congregational meeting. It would be a discussion I would have with the elders, and then it would go to the council, and then it would go before the congregation. This would be somebody that, after we've talked to them and banned them from the Lord's Supper, continues to live in unrepentant sin, open and unrepentant sin. Notice that they can still attend and hear God's word. Why do you think that is? Because the word of God could reverse the outcome of them being uh, sinning. In the, exactly. of the, the whole reason is not to condemn you to hell. We want to save you. So we're bringing it to your attention in the strictest possible way that we have. Look, you're no longer in communion with us. You're no longer a right and upstanding member. But you know what? All sin is forgiven. So we want you to hear the law and hear the gospel so that the Holy Spirit can bring you back into our midst and that would involve him moving you to repent of your sin. And repentance is not only, I'm sorry, forgive me, but I desire to change. So if I'm shacking up with a woman who's not my wife, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to go to my wife and try to make amends. And maybe she'll divorce me, but that means that I continue to ask forgiveness. Because divorce is a sin, right? Yes. Divorce is a forgiven sin. Special applications, uh, Office of the Keys in regards to the pastoral office. Through the keys, Christ grants his church the power of the keys. So this Office of the Keys is given to the church, specifically to the local congregation. 
So when Lamb of God became a, a church of Christ, a congregation, Christ gave them this power of the keys. It goes to the church. Because God desires all things to be done in an orderly manner that glorifies him, each congregation chooses a man to fill this office, to use these keys for them as their guy who is the key bearer. A guy who's trained in doctrine, meets the biblical qualifications, which are 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. And um, we just have 1 Timothy 3, 2, but that's enough. Therefore, an overseer or a bishop or an episcopus or similar terms, which are all used to translate a, a, a leader of a congregation a pastor, must be above reproach, husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable. A man who's trained. A man that's not perfect because no man is perfect, but a man that understands doctrine, understands who Christ is, understands the sacraments, understands the things that are taught in Scripture. A man who's ordained and installed to fulfill the public administration of the keys, word, and sacrament worship. And that's important. I mean, the congregation has it, right? So that means, Tim, you could stand up and pronounce absolution. Barb, you're a member of the congregation. You could stand up and do it. And then Wendy and Paxton can stand up and do it. And by the time everybody had their chance to stand up and pronounce absolution, it'd be time to go home. We didn't want to get to the gospel or anything. Uh, and, and orderly worship is done because we reverence and respect God. And we want all things to be orderly, and we want to be able to hear the message that he has proclaimed. And so rather than everybody doing it, we pick one man to do it. And that involves you guys to fulfill the vocations you've been called to. I study scriptures. I preach. You guys work in the kitchen to help with the Franklin Avenue mission. You go out and do this. You do that. You do this job in the church. You do finances. You help fix things. Those are all things I don't have to do so I can focus on this. And you can do them because you don't have to sit down and grab the Greek and try to go through it and study. I've done that for you. And it's once again, that goes back to us being the body of Christ. We all have a particular job, and together we work as one with the body to get God's mission done. God mandates the office of the pastor. The pastoral office is necessary for each congregation. In other words, if you can't be a church without a pastor in the LCMS. Paul raised up men to act as a shepherd of planted churches. That's one of the things he did. He went from place to place. He formed a church, a bunch of believers, and then put a man there to be their pastor and to do the office of the keys for them. He assigned Timothy and Titus to do this. Called, ordained, and installed to deliver God's grace through the public administration of the keys in word and sacrament worship, that's what a pastor does. In uh, the Apology, or in the Augsburg Confession, which is one of our doctrinal statements uh, that Luther wrote, it says, our churches teach that no one should publicly teach in the church or administer the sacraments without a rightly ordered call. One of the reasons why you'll never see a politician speak from our pulpit in worship. Only the called and ordained servants do. So I do, uh, Pastor Hensler does as a called and ordained servant. We don't let anybody else do that. Because we don't anybody want anybody to stand up there and to preach from the pulpit things that are not right and not true and lead people astray. Here's a good question. Why not women pastors? I was going to ask that because you said men less than two minutes ago. Men, men, men. men. Yep. I, I'm going to tell you something. If it was if it was 1950s or 1960s, I wouldn't have a problem teaching this. As we go by, it becomes more and more of a problem. There'll come a day when this kind of teaching will land me uh, to be degraded on Facebook to be made fun of, to be outcast. There may even come a day when I could lose my, <laughs> we, we could be shut down as a church uh, if culture continues to go that way. But let's talk about it. We have reasons, and it's not because we hate women, okay? It's not because of that. The church is an outgrowth of the original design for human relationship. The original design, when God created man and woman, he had a design and he had functions for them and the church is all grows out from that. That's the basic human relationship of society and also the church. Adam created first, given the law, named the animals, and then given Eve as a helper, not a slave, 
not a servant, not a maid, but as a helper. Adam had his vocation and his jobs and his gifts. Eve had hers. Adam would never conceive and bear a child. Eve would. And there's things that Adam was given to do that Eve wasn't. Generally, and you can find exceptions, you could probably find a woman that could bench press more weight than you. You probably could. She'd probably be Russian, and she would have facial hair, but you probably could. <laughs> there, the, one of the greatest examples of this was a case, and I think it was in one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, there was a guy who had a sex change operation and changed his identity to be a woman. He entered into a, a weightlifting competition and beat all the other women. And people cried foul. Why? He because out he Why? Because his body was built different than any other woman. His bone structure and muscles were far greater than most other women he went up against. Because God designed him that way. And generally, that's how it is. Men are designed by God and meant to do things different than women. Same thing. No man will ever give birth to a woman. You're not designed and functioned to do that. After the fall, God came to Adam. Even though Eve ate the apple first or ate the fruit first, who did God come to? Adam. Adam was a spiritual head. Adam received the law. God basically said, Adam, where were you? Satan was talking to Eve. Why didn't you drag her away? Why didn't you remind her, hey, God said this. We're not supposed to eat this fruit. But Adam stood there like an idiot with his mouth shut. And there's men that do the same thing today. They're the ones that should get the family to church and sit there with their mouth shut and do nothing. And so in a lot of families, the women have to do it. But know that the original design was for man, for Adam to be the spiritual head. He was given the law. He was supposed to be in charge of all things spiritual, and he failed. And when that happens, the woman has to step up. Let's look at some of these versions. Somebody read Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Notice Paul says, Christ is, uh, Christ is the head of the church as the husband is the head of the wife. So the husband, especially in the spiritual sense, has been given a position. He has a job. He's the one that's supposed to start prayer. He's the one that's supposed to get to church. He's the one that's supposed to say, let's do Bible study. He has a job within the family. That's been given to the man. Uh, and, and he would do it in a loving way. If you go on to read uh, this section of Ephesians, husbands are told to love their wives and be sacrificial to them like Christ was. We should be willing to die for our wife because we love them so much. So this idea of us having charge over our wives is not to make them cook and clean and change our slippers and be our uh, footrest. That's not it. Like Christ loved the church and gave his life, we love our wives and give our lives toward them because we love them so much. We serve as their husbands. That's the relationship. First uh, Timothy 3, 2. Somebody read that. Therefore, go ahead, Barb. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife or a man of one woman, sober minded, self controlled, respectable. Notice here, Paul doesn't include or wife of one husband. He points out uh, the husband of one wife. Paul is giving this authority or this position to the man. Uh, now, somebody go ahead and read 1 Timothy 2, those uh, verses that are listed there. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, before you women rise against me in anger or want to curse Paul, know that the context here is worship. Paul is not talking about everyday life at home. He's talking about worship. 
So in worship, it's men that should pray, lifting their holy hands without anger or quarreling. And as a little sidebar, if your hands are up like this praying, they're not down like this in fists, which is how they are when you quarrel. Women are not permitted to teach or exercise authority over a man in church, meaning from the pulpit. A woman should not be preaching the word of God and exercising that authority. That's not what God has given. In the home, it's a totally different thing. Remember, Eve was created to be Adam's helpmate and given special gifts. If the woman at home is in charge of the finances and says, when we buy stuff and when we pay stuff, that's fine. Especially if that's her gift. God gave your wife to you to do something that you're not good at. And maybe instead of her cooking, you do the cooking, and that's fine. In the home life, this is not applicable. This is applicable in the church, in worship. So how do we look at it as Lutherans? Um, women don't preach. Women can read scripture. Women can teach uh, children's church. Um, if a woman was qualified to teach a Bible study, I might let that happen, but generally I teach them or a man teaches them. If you, we were in the Wisconsin Synod, women, they truly take this by the book. You don't do anything in the church. You remember, it used to be women didn't even vote. Voting is not worship. There's no problem with voting. What this means is in worship. And so what we're taking is we're taking this idea from Genesis of God making man the spiritual head, and here you see it played out in the New Testament. So one of the things that's argued is, well, this was just a restriction for this time in this, in this land. Things are different now because we're in this whole new society where women naturally do more and we've woken up and we're a lot smarter. We're smarter than they are and everything's better. Well, I don't think so. We're not smarter and everything's not better. In fact, Rome was a cesspool. There's plenty of places in this country right now that are cesspools even worse than Rome. We're not better. Uh, we may think we are. So when we see something spoken against in the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, men were the priests, and we have Adam being charged with the law that's supposed to keep kept over Eve. So it's there in the Old Testament, and it's here in the New Testament, in a Greek culture. That tells us that this is not just something that was for one time. This is God's idea and, and command for all time, throughout the ages of Scripture, and for us now. Uh, one more verse, and then I'll open it up for questions. Titus 1, 5 through 6. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Okay. Paul left uh, Titus in Crete so he could appoint elders in every town. Husbands of one wife appoint men. Who did Christ choose? Twelve men. Now, as those twelve men went around, none of them had jobs. You know who supported them? Women. Men. Some of those women were women of influence. Um, in the court of kings and of rulers, and they supported him. So women were important. How did Jesus teach treat women? With great respect. If you were a Jewish man, you didn't even speak to a woman that wasn't your wife. And even your wife, you didn't speak to her out in public. Jesus spoke to women. He forgave women. He healed women. Great respect for women. But he didn't appoint any of them to be disciples or apostles. Questions on this? I'm bracing myself. I'm holding on to the table. Let her rip. You look in other faiths. Uh -huh. You have women pastors. You do? Are they wrong? Or are they just wrong in the teachings of the church? I know women pastors that are a blessing. Um, their churches are growing. They preach the gospel purely. They seem to be have the Holy Spirit with them. If the Holy Spirit chooses to work through a woman pastor, who am I? 
to say it's wrong. I would never come in and say, well, Holy Spirit, you're not supposed to do this, right? So I'm very reticent to say that it's wrong. However, is it good to go against God's plan? His divinely revealed plan. People want to say that uh, it's okay in this day and age because Christ is a, is a God of love that men can marry men and live together. But that's not okay. It's clearly spoken against in scripture, isn't it? To be honest yeah. with you, I wish, I wish it was okay. I don't like having to say that men can't marry men and women can't marry women. It's going to make me really unpopular. And once again, it'll be one of those things that I can be vilified for it on Facebook and eventually government could try to shut us down for being hate groups. I can't say it's right because scripture clearly says it's wrong. Not only was it not the design of creation, but over and over again throughout the Old Testament, it's spoken of as a sin, a sin that people should be stoned if they did it. And in the New Testament, Paul speaks against it as some of the vilest sin that can be committed. So going against God's plan and design for men and women is wrong. And if you're going to be his church based on his teaching, do you want to do it in a way that stands against his design? Is that the right way to do it? If we're going to say that we have the sacraments based on God's will and promise in the Testament, and you're going to have somebody preside over them who clearly scripture says shouldn't be presiding over it, is that the way you should do it? Now, there are faithful women pastors uh, however, you can look at some of the churches that have allowed women pastors, which are the Episcopal Church, is a great example, or the Lutheran, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, which is our bigger sister denomination. They have women pastors. Uh, both the Episcopal Church and ELCA also ordain homosexuals and do homosexual marriages. And uh, while Scripture doesn't speak on this, you can see this in other denominations. It's happening in the Presbyterian Church as well. When you open the pulpit to women, then you start to open it to other things that are clearly spoken of against Scripture. I'm not saying that women pastors are the reason why, per se, that they ordain and, and do homosexual marriages. But once you open the door to one exception of Scripture and say, well, Scripture doesn't really say that, you open the door to others. There are, and this is a little bit of a change of subject, the same platform that homosexuals have used to, there are churches that are homosexual friendly, that say Christ is a Christ is a God of love and it's fine and God blesses it. And the same uh, plan and message and, and platform that they use to get that through the churches is being used now by people that want to have sex with minors. Ew. It's out there. They're following the same playbook. Embrace yourself in this society. Once you get us, you know, right now we, right, Candace, you say it's you. But if you don't have God's word to speak against it, or you don't recognize God's word as being an authoritative word, all you have to do is change society's opinion from you. Well, well, if they're happy. If the 14-year-old doesn't mind, and the adult doesn't mind, and the parents don't mind, who am I to say? It's That's still a sin. It is a sin, but in society, all you have to do is change it from being you. And if you have, don't recognize God's words of authority, then all of a sudden it becomes permissible. Because society doesn't have a problem with it. Society doesn't look to God's word anymore. It doesn't recognize God's words as authoritative. A science doesn't or, or a society doesn't really recognize the fact that there is a God who rules over all things. That's where we're headed. So in the church, we stand by God's word as being authoritative and we follow it. Because once you open the door to one exception, where do you stop? Make sense? Yes, it does. I would really like to be able to say women can be pastors. I, I have a good friend who, uh, from my previous church, Lutheran church, whose daughter wanted to be a pastor, so she joined the Presbyterian church so she could be. And uh, we don't talk about it when I see him, but I, I really wish I could tell him, yeah, that's blessed. I can't. I'm not going to go ring up his house in the middle of the night and tell him. But 
I would love to. I don't have an vendetta against women. I just have to follow what God's word says. God's word says a lot of things that I wish were different, but are not. Any other final questions on anything that we talked about tonight? I do. So say um, I, I, was, I was baptized and then I fell off the path and I came back and started to realize my wrongdoings. Do I have to be baptized again or no? What's it done for baptism, sweetheart? Um, the fact that you realized that you were wrong, that the Holy Spirit was able to reach into your heart and pull you back was because you were baptized. Holy Spirit's still there and working. He's very patient. We call him the hound of heaven. Christ died and shed his blood for you. He's not going to give up on you easily. And he will be after you and after you and after you. And even if you're not reading scripture, there's something that we've called, this is very useful for me, realizing this. It's called the law unpreached. The law unpreached is when you're not a believer, not reading scripture, and all of a sudden you lose your job. Or you're diagnosed with cancer. Or your husband leaves you. Or anything else that is life-changing and earth-shattering in your life that forces you to realize that you can't handle life on your own. That's the law unpreached. And the Holy Spirit uses that to turn you back to the one who can handle it and will help you through it. And who offers you eternal life when all of these problems that I just mentioned are gone. Thank you. That answers the question for a family member of mine. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Good one. Other questions? This help explain some hard things for you, things you maybe wondered about. Did you ever wonder why there weren't any men or any women pastors in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? Or maybe you thought there were and they just weren't here. We do have something called deacon, deaconesses. And that's something that's open for women and they operate in a lot of ways like a pastor does. They're trained, uh, synodically trained. Uh, they can preach to women. They do a number of things. It used to be deacons were kind of like the, uh, um, the nuns trained, they were trained to be nurses and to help out in hospitals. That's originally kind of where it came from. And, you know, one of the differences between men and women is women kind of naturally have, they have the motherly instinct. And not that men can't have it, but women seem, women seem to abound, abound, abound in it. Would you women agree with that? Yeah. You, okay. So one of the reasons it's, it's good, right, and salutary for a pastor to be married because as his helpmate, he has a woman who has what he might be lacking. And my wife will do that all the time. You know, I'll tell her how oh, so-and-so came from home from the hospital. Well, maybe they might like dinner made. Yeah. Duh, I wasn't even thinking about that. I'm thinking, oh. They're home. I don't have to go visit them now. I can pray with them from home. They can eventually come back to worship and I can bless them. But she's thinking about things that I'm just not geared for. Or maybe we should call them. Maybe send a card or something. So she has that kind of motherly loving instinct that not that I don't have it, but it's just not at the forefront of my thinking. And it is at hers. So once again, there's the two be when in marriage, the two become one. And uh, God does that for a reason. And I think, uh, Wendy and Paul, maybe you've noticed this. You each have gifts that the other one lacks, and you fill in for it. Definitely. Wendy, you're really good at modeling the kitchen. And Paul, you're really <laughs> <laughs> on the couch now. We are different in some ways. <laughs> My wife is better at fixing things than I am. She, re she received a gift from her father. She can just look at things and see things that I can't. She is, I'll, I'll admit it. She's given that gift, and that's not a problem. When she needs something heavy moved, guess who does it? Yep. <laughs> Put the board in place, and she hooks it up. Funny story on that. Right after we were first married, I'm in the kitchen cooking dinner. The phone rings. It's her mother. I said, hold on. I'll get her for you. I was in the kitchen cooking. She was downstairs in the parking lot changing the headlights of the car. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you guys were each using the gifts that God gave you, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Any other questions or comments uh, that anybody wanted to make but did not? And, and then once again, you know, if you're uncomfortable in this setting, but you want to talk to me privately, email me, call me, and we can talk. Okay. All right. Uh, next week, we will talk about the Lord's Supper, but we'll also talk about Lamb of God in that we're going to kind of discuss how Lamb of God came to be, and we'll talk our governance, uh, how we're set up, how we're organized, and I hope to have uh, Ron Jonas, our uh, church council member, and Irv Glan, our head elder, if not some of the other people there, so you can meet them. Or at least have pictures to put with faces on who does things. Great thing about the Lutheran Church is pastor is not expected to run the whole thing. Uh, I've been given and trained to be uh, in charge of spiritual things. But that does not mean I'm good at finances or good at all other kinds of things. So... Uh, we believe the Lord surrounds the pastor with people that have those gifts. And once again, the church is the body and we all work together. There are places that have what we call hair pastor who feels he has to run everything. Those are pretty limited because even if he has talents in all those areas, he's only one man and he can't do it all. And you'll die trying. So I hope to see you next week and we'll talk about the Lord's Supper and Lamb of God and God's blessings on your evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pastor.